So 2019 really was the ideal time to start a YouTube channel focused on economics, because the months since this channel has taken off have not exactly had many dry news days. The economic impacts of the coronavirus have been felt far and wide, and we have covered these problems in depth in a handful of videos on this channel. But the logical question that most people are asking now is what comes next? Disasters happen and they are never pleasant. But a big part of being a nation, a business, or even an individual is being able to deal with adversity and come out the other side. Because of this, people are expecting a recovery of sorts, and it seems like the only point of contention will be what letter of the alphabet this recovery will represent. You have likely heard of a V-shaped recovery, so called because it would reflect a sharp decline in financial markets and a sharp recovery making the shape of a V. Other speculations include a W-shaped recovery, where we will see one recovery and then another decline as the effects of government stimulus and relief packages wear off, only to be followed by another genuine recovery later on. Pretty much at this point, if a letter has some kind of topography, alphabet-obsessed economists have used it in a prediction. Of course, the big issue with this is that nobody can really predict the future, so that means until this whole thing plays out, we really won't know for certain. But that doesn't mean that these predictions are simply the result of economists desperately trying to justify their existence in an increasingly difficult job market either. In fact, policies and procedures should be put in place by governments to appropriately deal with any of these types of recoveries, if and when they happen. But amongst all of this, there is one type of recovery that we should all be very afraid of. One that is not getting nearly as much airtime, and one that is actually been hurt by a lot of the current policies. That is the K-shaped recovery. What's more is that this type of recovery is not a hypothetical or a speculation. It is happening right now before our eyes, and that shouldn't come as a surprise. It was actually the same type of recovery we experienced after 2008. So perhaps predicting anything different is the real far-fetched reality here. But as always, we need to look at a few things to really understand what this K-shaped recovery looks like. So what even is a K-shaped recovery? What are the forces that are driving it? How should governments, businesses, and individuals plan for it? And while we are having fun speculating, what will this mean for our economies into the future? This episode of Economics Explained was made possible by our sponsor, Trends, which is in my opinion one of the most valuable and undiscovered knowledge hubs on the face of the internet. Trends is part of The Hustle, which if you guys are not already subscribed to, is hands down one of the best daily email newsletters for everything tech and business. When Trends reached out to the channel to see if we'd be interested in having them on as a sponsor, I genuinely got really excited, because one thing that I get asked a lot on Patreon is advice on starting a business and how to network with smart people, which is exactly what Trends is all about. With a subscription to Trends, you have exclusive and private access to a community of industry thought leaders in virtually every field. Even better, Trends makes it super easy to digitally network with over 5,000 entrepreneurs, investors, and startup CEOs. It's truly a community at heart, and I can't say enough good things about it. I'd also be remiss if I didn't mention that Trends also has an incredible content library. If you guys like watching these videos, you are going to love reading exclusive articles that are only available to subscribers of Trends, just like the ones that you see on screen. Thanks to this sponsorship, you can get a two-week trial for just $1 by going to trends.co slash ee. The link is on the screen now and in the video description below. Now, a V or a U or a W shaped recovery is pretty easy to understand. Just put that letter over the top of the Dow Jones Industrial Average price chart and hey presto, predictions are made. But the eagle-eyed amongst you might have realised that K doesn't really work for this. It's got too many little squiggly bits. So, what is a K-shaped recovery? A K-shaped recovery starts out the same way as any other recovery profile, with some kind of economic decline. The largest quarterly drop in GDP growth in recorded history and swelling unemployment figures should fill that in pretty nicely. Now, as for the actual recovery part of the K-shaped recovery, that splits into two, just like the letter. 
with one portion of the economy going back or even exceeding past prosperity, and the other portion of the economy continuing to fall behind. Now in this case the divide between these two portions of the economy are wealthy asset owners and big businesses in one category, and regular wage earners and small businesses in the second category. Shocking, I know. This is already starting to happen, and the results are clear. The S&P 500 grew to its highest level ever in the same month that the overall economy recorded those record losses. America's 400 richest people have added a staggering $637 billion to their collective net worth, while unemployment has spiked into double digits. Now the reason that this is happening is that financial markets, which drive the wealth of most American billionaires, are planning for the long term. Investors know that eventually this health crisis will come to an end, and at that time the businesses that they own will be there and ready to start turning a profit once again. So long as their companies survive through a year or so of slower businesses, they will come out the other end all the same. The chances of them actually making it through that have been massively improved by generous government stimuluses and record low interest rates, which means even businesses whose core operations have been impacted are feeling pretty flush with cash. What's more is that this is the worst case scenario. For a lot of businesses like Amazon and Uber, the idea of a world avoiding shopping centres and public transport has been a massive short term win. Now unfortunately, the average world citizen does not have the luxury of making financial plays over years or decades, they have to put food on the table today. Which without a job can be extremely hard. Sure, government support is there, but for most households it will not come fast enough or provide enough income to support their daily living expenses. This means that for those families they will have to do one of two things. The first is cut back on those living expenses. And no, we are not talking about giving up a morning Starbucks or a Disney Plus subscription, we are talking about deciding whether or not to pay electricity bills or groceries. Now the second option is that they can start digging into their assets. Now given that more than 70% of American adults have less than $1000 in savings, these might not be the assets that you're thinking of. People will have to sell homes, cars and other personal belongings. In the off chance that they have some retirement savings, it might mean smashing open that piggy bank prematurely. The Australian government has allowed its citizens early access to their retirement savings for exactly this reason. This policy allowed people economically impacted to access up to $20,000 that would have otherwise been locked away until the age of 65. Now in the short term, this was fine. It allowed people to make their next mortgage or rent repayment, but a majority of people accessing this cash were younger families that had decades left of potential compounding over the course of their working lives. $20,000 today may keep food on the table, a roof over the head and the lights on, but it means foregoing hundreds of thousands of dollars at retirement. Now it really is difficult to comment on this being a good policy or a bad policy. Even the cushiest retirement probably doesn't mean much if your young family is out on the streets. But what it does show is that a downturn hurts everybody, but the true devastation is not felt in the weeks or months of scary headlines, it is felt, compounded over a lifetime by those who couldn't weather the storm. The Australian example looks at people who were fortunate enough to actually have retirement savings. For some people, the solution will be accruing debt. Racking up credit cards, personal loans and maybe even refinancing their home if they're lucky enough to own one. For these families, they will wish that they were missing out on compound interest because it's going to be hurting them in the other direction, with loan payments that might go on for years after the crisis. One other really important thing to keep in mind amongst all of this is that this will not simply be those with means writing things out while everyone else gets pushed under. This chaos will actually present a great opportunity for those at the top part of this K-shaped recovery. The 2008 financial crisis presented a very similar situation to the one that we are in now, albeit probably a little bit more watered down. In the wake of that crisis, people were able to capitalise by buying up distressed properties and companies. Blackstone is a private equity company that today is one of the largest residential landlords in the United States, thanks to the 30,000 homes they purchased out of foreclosure in the wake of the 2008 subprime mortgage crisis. 
Blackstone, in a recent letter to their shareholders detailing their 2020 quarter 2 performance, made a note of the fact that they had $156 billion in dry powder. Dry powder is a fancy finance term for cash or cash equivalents that are ready to be invested. What this means in plain English is that they are poised, ready to snap up some bargains as soon as they go on sale. Be that in the form of cheap houses from forced sales, loans to households trying to stay afloat, or shares in a financial market that seems oblivious to the wider economy. Blackstone is just one example of this. Lots of seriously wealthy institutions and individuals have been hoarding a lot of cash for exactly this reason. Capitalising on economic misfortune feels bad, but realistically businesses do this all the time. They are entities designed to run an efficient market. If they see an asset priced below value, they buy it. If they see an asset priced above value, they sell it. It's just that in the midst of an economic downturn, this mechanical process can seem a bit mm, Scrooge McDucky. But for the businesses that can do it, good on them. It's a sign of solid asset management. That's what they're there for. What is also solid company management are the plans that are not so secretly been worked on for after the recovery. We will actually do a video on this topic in much more detail in the next few weeks, but for now, there are billions of people around the world who are working from home full time. This has been a big technical challenge for a lot of companies, but necessity is the mother of invention and a lot of companies have made that leap. With the realisation that almost all professional office space work can be done from home, comes the realisation that almost all professional office space work can be done from Manila or Mumbai. Okay, doom and gloom aside, big picture, it sounds like there should be some steps to take to avoid the special K becoming a regular occurrence that hits developed nations every 10 years or so. So how do we avoid the K? This is something that is ultimately going to come down to governments and individuals. If businesses can make money off misfortune, they are going to make that money, but it should be the role of governments to avoid this as much as possible, and, to be honest, for people to take a bit of personal responsibility as well. On a national level, or even a global level, downturns see a peak in inequality. Now regardless of your opinions on wealth inequality, be they good or bad, even the most hardcore fat cats would probably agree that this divide should be driven by people getting richer during the good times rather than most people becoming poorer during the bad times. So something needs to be put in place to account for this. Now counter-cyclical fiscal stimulus in the form of government grants, welfare checks, business loans or tax cuts are great, but it's actually only half of the solution and if anything it's the least important half. Fiscal policy has two modes, expansionary and contractionary. Expansionary fiscal policy is what we are seeing now. The government is trying to prop up the economy by pumping money into it, but they almost always fail at flipping the switch back over to contractionary fiscal policy. Contractionary fiscal policy involves taxing more and giving less government money away, which are not exactly political campaign winning slogans. So governments are often a lot slower to adopt these types of policies. Now despite what even most economists think, contractionary fiscal policy isn't used to save up a pool of money during the good times. Sure, it certainly can do that, but I mean a lot of developed governments have completely given up the dream of a surplus in the next million years or so. No, the real motivation of a contractionary fiscal policy is to get people used to living in a world where cash doesn't necessarily come easy. Taxes are high and less government spending means on average people will be bringing in less money. Of course, since this is only done during times of economic prosperity, the overall health of the economy will more than make up for this, but nobody, not businesses, municipalities nor individuals, will be lulled into a sense of complacency. Now a lot of people will argue that this is just starving the economy of oxygen, and it kind of is in a sense. To really stretch that analogy, world class athletes will often train in high altitude environments to get used to exercising with thinner oxygen. That then means that when game day comes, the thick air of sea level gives them a new boost of energy beyond what they have been trained with. Contractionary fiscal policy is training the economy for tough times. But come on, welcome to the modern western world. No one wants to put in effort anymore, so 
If you want to prepare for this, you're going to have to do it yourself. On an individual level, everybody knows the solution. Live below your means and save money. There is a great adage that a healthy economy is like a high tide. Everybody gets to frolic in the ocean and have fun. But as soon as the tide goes out, you get to see who wasn't wearing any pants or, put basically, who was living beyond their means. People can get away with living paycheck to paycheck for a long time during economic booms, but if they find themselves pantless at low tide, it is already too late for them. They have lived beyond their means and now they are going to pay for it. A lot of people might say, well that's their fault. But one of the issues here is that the means of the average American household doesn't pay for the lifestyle that people expect of the average American household. If you think of middle America, you'll probably think of a four bedroom, three bathroom house, two cars, a holiday every year, and maybe a few toys paid for with one and a half working adults. The thing is though, even two average full-time jobs don't pay for that kind of lifestyle in most areas of America anymore. But since that standard of living is the assumption, people continue to fall into it. The Overspent American is a book by the economist Juliet School that chronicles the way that the American dream has increasingly moved upscale while simultaneously everyday costs of living have risen and wages have remained stagnant. This isn't a uniquely American problem either. Most developed western nations are dealing with a very similar predicament. So even though everybody knows the solution deep down, live below your means and have an emergency fund, not a lot of people are willing to do it. To really prove this point, let's compare this reality to nations that actually do have a high savings rate. China, Korea, Singapore. In these countries, you will find things like multi-generational housing is commonplace, where families will have up to four generations living in the same household, with parents working and grandparents looking after the children. Now this is obviously hugely financially beneficial for everyone because not only are housing costs reduced, but so too are things like utilities, spending on furniture, land rates and household upkeep, all while having childcare built into the package. All of that said though, living with your parents past the age of 25 in most western nations still carries a bit of a stigma with it. The K is coming and it is going to be more devastating to a lot of households than receiving that same response in a text message. The shape of recovery might not matter much for a majority of people if they are already sunk. Times of crisis are times of opportunity, but it's important to have the discussion about whether this opportunity should come in the form of taking advantage of distressed households. Now it's easy to shrug this distress off as the result of people living beyond their means, but as we've seen, that has become increasingly easy to do. Outside of everything, it should go without saying that you probably want to be on the right side of that K, and to be there, you need to make good investments. Of course, the best investment you can make is in yourself, and I can't think of a better place to start building out that portfolio than with Trends. Trends is home to a wealth of exclusive articles that I know you are going to absolutely love, like this guy that went from being three days away from insolvency to building a $400 million a year business. What's also really neat is that you can RSVP for exclusive Q&A live streams with famous startup CEOs and so much more. If you want to support Economics Explained and help make these videos possible while also getting a really great deal, check out trends.co slash ee which will give you access to trends for two weeks for just one dollar. The link is on the screen now and in the video description below. As always, thanks guys. Bye.